I now I leave the floor to our next speaker, uh, Nicolas Lahaye from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in USA. Um, welcome, Nicolas. Hello, and thank you. Let me get my slides up here. Okay. Um, Hello again, uh, I'm Nick. Uh, I'm a data scientist at JPL, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about some work I've done um, generating a kind of generic segmentation and tracking system, and then a concrete application uh, with wildfires, burn scars, and uh, smoke plumes. Um, Thing over here. Okay, um, so generally the, the motivation behind this work came from the goal to be able to use um, current instruments and historical instruments as kind of a pre-existing sensor web. Um, so currently to kind of use lots of instruments collectively, uh, there's lots of manual effort that has to go into that. Um, there's different resolutions, different grids, different pointing angles, and even just different uh, uh, domain knowledge to, to actually use the, the data. Um, and so the goal is to be able to kind of generate a system that could be as plug and play as possible with the understanding that there's some kind of configuration at the front and back that needs to be updated for a specific problem and a specific uh, data set. Uh, so the first step here was to be able to fuse data together and then also segment and identify different kinds of objects in imagery, both from single sensors and from multi-sensors. Um, and so if we have multiple sensors uh, over the same uh, spatiotemporal area, we can collocate the data. Um, currently, what we do is we uh, resample to the lowest resolution that we have um, for uh, one or more instruments. I guess it'd be two or more instruments. Um, so we're not like doing any kind of super resolution or um, kind of making up data if there's a kind of a low fidelity super resolution uh, implementation that we're using. Um, and then we kind of pass it through a traditional uh, data science pipeline, cleaning anything, um, doing any scaling. And then we use this architecture called the restricted Boltzmann machine. Um, I'm first gonna talk about kind of the flat traditional architecture, and then I'll talk about how we're kind of evaluating convolutional architectures. Um, and then that output is just passed now to uh, uh, clustering. Um, from there, we have uh, a segmentation of the data. Um, so like lots of efforts, including what's kind of currently being used as like semi-supervised or self-supervised learning um, requires some amount of labels to do the segmentation. And so that requires manual outlining of specific pixels. Um, the big benefit here with what we're doing is we generate the segmentation first, and then you can go in and apply context after the fact. So it kind of mitigates that the significant amount of effort required to do some of that segmentation um, or labeling. Um, <clears throat> and kind of an example, we'll come back to this uh, when I go over results later, but um, this is a, a scene over the Williams Flat Fire in 2019 in Washington. Um, and this, the imagery is coming from two instruments aboard the same satellite, um, the Terra satellite, the Miser and MODIS instruments. Um, they have varying spectral resolution. So one is a single camera with 38 bands. Another, the Miser, Miser instrument is nine cameras pointing at different angles. Um, and each of them have four spectral bands, the same spectral bands across each image. Uh, we combine all that information together. Um, and we provide this unsupervised segmentation. You can then go in and apply context to a subset of those uh, clusters or uh, segments. And what you're left with is this bottom right here, the fire and smoke identification. And I'll talk about the differences and um, kind of, I guess I can start here. Um, the way that these label uh, contexts can be applied is either completely manually, if there's no labels existent, um, which I'll show an example of later. If there are label sets, um, usually what we do is kind of a hybrid approach where we do best agreement to the pre-existing labels. Um, and then we kind of clean that up. Um, like in this instance, there's this pre-existing modus thermal anomaly data. Um, and we noticed, um, and it's also been recognized previously that it's identifying a lot of hot smoke, not just kind of the fire front. Um, so we have a reduction in identified fire pixels, but uh, we kind of know why, and we think we're doing uh, a better job at identifying strictly the fire front with our fire um, segmentation. Um, and then we kind of do uh, best agreement and a little bit of cleanup for the smoke identification as well. 
Um, so the restricted Boltzmann machine that I mentioned is uh, the, in its most basic state is a simple two-layer architecture. Um, it uh, it's unsupervised. It can be strapped to uh, heads to do supervised learning, but um, here we're using it in an unsupervised way. Um, so its aim is to learn a representation of the input distribution, um, typically in a higher or lower distribute. Uh, sorry, higher or lower feature space than the than the inputs feature space um, to either do feature reduction, compression, distillation of the information, or to do feature expansion to better represent uh, nonlinear patterns in a simpler way for a further model to kind of key on. <clears throat> and I'll talk about our choice in that way in a, in a little bit. Um, these can be stacked. So you can you train one layer at a time. Um, one of these RBMs at a time, but you can have them in sequence to create a deep network. Um, it mitigates some of the extreme um, requirements on memory uh, that like back propagation and kind of deeper um, multi-layer perceptron type architectures require because you can do a single layer at a time. Um, and there's also convolutional versions of these, which I'll, I'll discuss again later. Um, Given the nature of the RBM, it's a special version of a Markov random field. And with that definition comes the, um, this energy function, which is a measurement of equilibrium, the state of the, the system. Um, also, we can define the probability of x uh, given that uh, as a, a function of the marginal distribution and also that energy function. Uh, if we use that to set up a log likelihood of the system, which would be our typical objective function if we were going to do something like um, back propagation. Uh, we set that up and we take the gradient and see that um, basically the gradient would be the difference of the actual distribution and the reconstructed uh, distribution. So H is uh, hidden values, which is the actual the output values. Uh, B is the bias of the visible layer. C is the bias of the hidden layer. And W is the are the the weight values uh, just for reference, um, but the the gradient computation in this way would require um, uh, MCMC convergence at each epoch of training of the model, so it's quite intractable to do something like backpropagation here. Uh, so instead, we use a training method called uh, contrastive divergence, where uh, we basically approximate that uh, distribution using a small number of Gibbs steps and Gibbs sampling, um, and then do some sort of reconstruction measure, uh, reconstruction error measurement um, to uh, try to minimize that reconstruction over time during the training process. Um, and the way that that is done um, in practice is, is a difference between these energy functions, between the um, actual distribution of the input and the approximated one uh, at each step during training. Um, and as that difference shrinks, then we know we're getting closer and closer to a good uh, representation. Um, so if we have a flat architecture, uh, we can't just pass imagery in as it is. Um, so for this simple version of the RBM, we take a pixel, all of its neighboring pixels, and every band that we're using across one or more instruments that we're using, and we flatten that out into a vector where the, the pixel of reference is in the center of that vector, and then everything else is just out to the sides. Um, so obviously we lose a bit of the spatial representation that say a conv convolutional uh, layer would give us, but as I'll show, it uh, still performs pretty well generally. Uh, <clears throat> and then the other thing is um, our output layer is larger than the featured space of the input. Um, and that is just due to empirical testing we found that uh, the clustering does a bit better when that feature space is expanded and it can kind of key on some of those complex patterns in that higher dimension space. Uh, the clustering algorithm that we used after, again, a comparison of a large number of them is Birch. Uh, originally, we landed on hierarchical clustering, which is uh, uh, the process of taking each sample uh, using or uh, identifying it as a separate cluster and then using a heuristic to merge them together into um, uh, subsets until you get to the user specified number of clusters. Um, <clears throat> the heuristic that we use is that each merge should 
minimize the variance um, of the new cluster sets um, at each step. Um, and we move from hierarchical clustering to BIRCH, which is an optimized version of hierarchical clustering, uh, just because we didn't degrade in performance and the amount of time to do the computation is significantly uh, less using BIRCH. Um, something that kind of sums up the structural representation. So we did kind of a large scale quantitative evaluation over um, uh, comparisons of our uh, model and our segmentations versus pre-existing segmentation sets, um, but the kind of a, a good qualitative summation of it. Um, so for just a baseline, we have these two um, satellite instruments, um, Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 aboard two separate um, platforms, we combine the data together, and then we look at structure represented when we do stuff with just the, the raw radiances or the actual data versus doing um, operations on the output from the RBM. So first, just as an initial baseline, we did PCA. We used the, the principal components that explain 99% of the variance. We ran um, the same clustering, and then we plotted using the first two principal components. Um, so this is not uh, quite a fair comparison to the other two because it's likely that more than two principal components are required to um, represent the structure. Um, but the, in this picture, uh, the visualization is quite noisy. There's no real separation of clusters. Um, and also just the actual performance of the segmentation was pretty poor. Um, the apples to apples comparison is here where we take a clustering of the raw radiances versus a clustering of the output of the RBM. We run TSNE on it um, and then visualize the TSNE and the output from the RBM <clears throat> provides a significant amount more uh, structure um, and separation of the clusters, uh, which is kind of what we're looking for. We're expecting there to be some semblance of structure and not really this kind of noisy setup, which uh, happens when we just use the raw data. Uh, so, Actual application, um, there are pre-existing fire products, there are pre-existing smoke products. Um, lots of the pre-existing smoke products have a tough time confusing or um, uh, discerning uh, cloud from smoke. And uh, um, there's not any uh, operational kind of airborne uh, fire products or fire products of that kind of higher resolution. Uh, so we wanted to create the ability to generate uh, fire and smoke products across multiple instruments again and, and um, fusions of instrument sets. Uh, so we looked at this example already. Uh, let me go to the other two. Let me see what time I have here. Sorry. Okay, so that time. Um, so this is a fusion of two airborne instruments. EMOS uh, it has 38 bands and I believe Actually, I don't remember which aircraft it flies aboard, um, but MASTER is another airborne instrument that has 50 spectral bands, um, and they are, given the aircraft they're on, their pixels are at about 30 and 50 meters, respectively. Um, <clears throat> there's a subset of the EMOS image, which is the one underneath, uh, where the MASTER uh, instrument took data um, in the same kind of time frame within minutes of one another. Um, and so we to do the evaluation of the fusion, um, we just use that subset. We also did evaluations of each instrument on their own. Um, since instruments aren't always co-located and overlapping, we want to be able to produce output at times when there's no fusion available. Um, <clears throat> to compare against, there is a there are pre-existing um, experimental fire masks for both uh, instruments. Um, one here is in purple and one here is in blue. As you can see, they both identify subsets of the fire front, but they don't really agree very well. Um, so I guess collectively they work well at identifying the fire front, but um, separate they identify only subsets. And that was the case across uh, all of the scenes that we evaluated. Um, and then there were these um, manual segmentations of smoke that were not really uh, fine enough for us to use as ground truth. Um, but we just kind of put them here to show that like this is some of the stuff that we come across as, as um, pre-existing quote unquote ground truth. And there's you know significant uncertainty associated with this kind of thing. And um, it's not as fine grained as we would expect or want in lots of cases. Um, so uh, we generate our kind of intermediate product here, this clustering. And then from there, uh, we did um, 
the hybrid approach for the fire, we did best agreements um, and then kind of did a manual tuning. And then for smoke, we did um, manual identification. Um, and this manual identification only has to happen in a small number of scenes. So you take like three to five scenes, you do the identification of the subset of segments or subset of clusters, and then that assignment can be used for any other images. So it's not like it has to happen for each image. Um, and then we are also able to identify burn scar um, pretty cleanly across, across all the images where we had this fusion <coughs> of instruments. Um, and the last example, uh, GOES is a geostationary satellite. This one specifically sits off the west coast of the United States. Um, it has 16 spectral bands ranging from, I think, one kilometer to four kilometers. Um, so we're resampling everything to four kilometers here. Um, it has pre-existing aerosol products, smoke products, and fire products. Um, as you can see in this example, uh, it confuses the entire smoke plume with uh, cloud, and therefore there's no retrieval over the entire smoke plume. Uh, whereas like in, in our product, we're able to identify the smoke plume and, and make a distinction between it and clouds. And then also it does a significant uh, over-identification of pixels over the fire front. Um, which really just exists in this area, um, which is even an overrepresentation given the low resolution of the data here. <clears throat> uh, so pretty well, uh, pretty good performance across different spatial spectral resolutions. Um, and we've also done comparisons in hyperspectral um, or with hyperspectral data as well. Um, so these are just some simple comparisons. Um, the agreement is pretty good in most cases. Uh, this this side here on the left is for fire and over here is for smoke. Um, there's a degradation and agreement percentage between ours and uh, pre-existing products. As I mentioned, the MODIS thermal anomaly data identifies hot smoke and other things that aren't just fire. Um, so it's not kind of a apples apples comparison here. Um, let's see, uh, there's significant increase in true positive. And the way that we did this was we combined both master any MOS pre-existing experimental products and compare it against those to see what kind of true positive or false positive uh, percentage we were getting and compare that to to those um, pre-existing products. Um, so as I mentioned, the identification that we're doing is kind of doing a good job of identifying things that are in both of the um, pre-existing products instead of just a subset as each of them are doing. Um, this number here we think is somewhat anomalous. Um, and we think that if we kind of expand the region and the time that this would decrease, um, just, I don't know, Veer's, the Veer's products seem to be, uh, not functioning as well as it usually does, um, over this, some of the scenes that we looked at. So this seems to be a bit, uh, incorrect in terms of general performance difference. Um, and then pretty good agreement, uh, in cases where we actually had, um, smoke products to compare against. As I mentioned, lots of times there's uh, kind of confusion and therefore no retrievals over areas where it thinks that there might be clouds. Uh, okay, we have five minutes. So let me just close up quickly and then I'll leave some time for questions. Um, current research, so as I mentioned, this is a generic tool. So we want to be able to use this in other domains and other applications. So currently we're looking at harmful algal blooms, um, water segmentation, in uh, FFSR imagery that doesn't, that kind of distorts some of the things that it sees on the ground. Um, in heliophysics, we're looking at ionospheric anomalies. We're also looking to um, provide different kinds of architectures depending on different levels of compute resources. So convolutional RBMs, um, uh, I know uh, Yulia has talked about potentially doing some graphical um, uh, GNNs here as well. Um, also including the clustering as part of the loss function and doing the clustering as kind of an automated part of the model um, learning is something that has been done in other research and we'd like to try to evaluate uh, in our toolbox, uh, which we're hoping to provide as open source in the next couple of months, um, hopefully this month, but we'll see. Um, and then utilizing shape approximations and cluster distributions to do automated tracking over time. So. Um, you know, in the short time range, shapes will distort a little bit less, and then we have uh, ideas of cluster distributions within those segments. Um, so using this intermediate clustering product, and then as time goes on, the shape distorts, so we wait, would wait that um, 
shape approximation information less, but still provide a certainty over time that say a smoke plume is, is the same smoke plume. Um, providing uncertainties on segmentation, so using like the, the cluster distance metrics and um, potentially some of the information from the, the RBM to provide an uncertainty, um, so you can kind of remove some of the boundary cases which are uncertain in manual segmentation or automated segmentation, um, and then kind of just look at the bulk of the certain area. And then doing like 2D and 3D reconstruction, um, uh, Yulia uh, Ignacio and some others have talked about potential collaborations using some topological information um, and then GNNs, as I mentioned before, um, and then applying transfer learning to get some of this knowledge on board, like drones and stuff to do automated segmentation on board. Um, yeah, that's, oh, and then I just wanna mention um, current research is being done under the uh, AAST project led by Yulia. <clears throat> um, so thank you and I'm happy to field any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. It was a really, really complete presentation. Um, if any of the attendees have any question, uh, please feel free to open their microphone. Another option is to write the question on the chat and we can read, uh, read it out loud. We open the floor to questions. Okay, if not, I can start with one. Um, so on this, um, actually, the, the 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 data input that you're using here is multi-channel, right? Do you select like any yeah. particular channel that is like more successful in detecting things than other, or? Um, in these first tests, we just kind of threw the kitchen sink at the model. Um, so we wanted to see how it would perform. In some of these cases, like this one, where we have issues with this, like the sun glint and some bright areas on the ground in the smoke segmentation. Um, we'd like to do some kind of feature importance and um, kind of explainability analysis and do some subsetting based on some, you know, pre-existing knowledge about which um, channels are usually used for, for smoke identification um, and whether, whatever other segmentations we're doing. Um, but currently we're just, we just kind of use all channels available as long as they're operating properly. Like there was one band from EMOS we had to remove because it wasn't properly operating over this um, data set. Yeah, interesting. Um, any any other question from the audience? Uh, here we have a question on the chat. Uh, have you tried a spectral PCA or something similar from uh, Supernum? Um, so like spectral PCA to just do feature reduction and then use that for clustering. Is that, is that the question? The one who asked the question could kind of mute if, if they want. Yes, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we did a bunch of just, um, kind of simple pre-processing, um, and like, um, PCA and spectral PCA and also just clustering on its own works really well when the spectral resolution is low. Um, but as we increase, crease and move spectral resolutions closer to hyperspectral data, um, you really need the kind of intermediary of a, some sort of um, neural net to do the um, identification of those latent patterns um, and allow the clustering to kind of do a good job on that, um, the, the features that it sees. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, uh, 